Dr. William Henry Griffith Thomas said, we cannot make up We cannot make up for failure in our devotional life by redoubling energy in service. Allow me to repeat that. And this is a fallacy. This is a mistake that so many Christians make. Dr. Thomas said, we cannot make up for failure in our devotional life, that is, in our prayer life, Bible reading life, by redoubling energy and effort in service. And this is what happens if you don't pray, uh, no matter how difficult it is if you don't pray in the mornings if you don't read uh, the word of God in the mornings if you're not sincere in your devotions you will be forced to try to redouble your efforts triple your efforts do more service think that you're going to gain ground and it doesn't work. It doesn't work because, and I'm adding this part, because you're doing it without God and without, without God's help and without God's blessings. You must put God, before you serve God, my dear friends, you must put God first in communication you must pray to him first. I don't care what you do as a child of God, even your secular work, your job, a trip that you're going on. I don't care if you're going on vacation. You need to talk with God about it first. You need to pray to him first. You need to clear it with him first. You need to ask him to bless it and to lead you and to guide you and to direct you. I don't care what your endeavor is that day. You need, I don't care if you're on vacation and you plan this and that, and this uh, romantic uh, candlelit dinner and all that. You better pray in the morning. I don't care what you're doing. Before you start any service of God, any church service, any ministry work, any soul winning effort, you need to pray to God first. You need to consult with God. You need to acknowledge God in all your ways. It's all about God and what He wants done. He said, Well, that doesn't sound like it's going to be a whole lot of fun. Listen to me very carefully. You're not going to have real fun unless you involve God in it. I know, I know you don't like it. I know you don't like it. I'm telling you. You and your family are not going to enjoy real fun until God is first. And yes, you can have fun in life if you put God first. Put Him first. Acknowledge Him in all of your ways. Stop trying to do life without Him. You are disrespectful to Him. You are disobedient to Him. Uh, you are rebellious towards Him. That's why you're sad no matter what, you, what you're doing. You're sad. You're depressed in your spirit. You're downcast because you are not acknowledging God. You're not putting God first. You are proud, you are stubborn, you are devilish, you're rebellious, and you're practicing witchcraft. Because you're trying to do life without God. And, uh, and uh, you can't do life without God successfully. 
and have peace in your soul and in your spirit, see? See, because you need to understand, dear friends, if you don't have peace deep down from God and joy and contentment right where you are, hear me well, I don't care if you travel to the Cayman Islands. I don't care if you travel to the beautiful blue-green seas of the Virgin Islands. You're going to be depressed, defeated, and disgusted sitting on the beach, mad as the devil at your life because uh, your problems are inside of you, and they're going to travel with you on the plane, on the bus, on the train, whatever. You need to get your heart right with God right where you are. You need to do what George Myers has been trying to teach you, and women especially for years. You need to enjoy everyday life. And then you really enjoy the mountaintop experiences. If you can enjoy everyday life down in the valley. And you can't do that without praying to God every morning and reading the word of God. My dear friends. Oh yeah, you say if you're born up against that, then you're probably lost. You have never been born again. Because every Christian knows this. Every born again Christian knows this. And I want to tell you another thing. Well, I prayed this morning. My, I, I didn't pray for my husband and my family. I didn't pray for my wife and my children and everything because I can't get along with them. I despise them. And every time we get together, we got to fuss about something. Well, then your prayers did not even hit the ceiling. You know why? Because God wants you to get right with your family, your spouse. The children with the parents, the parents with the children. God is not hearing your prayers by yourself, and you got a whole family to pray with, and you and you and you refuse to pray with them. Now it's okay for you to pray first by yourself. I highly recommend it, but make sure you pray with your family. Don't start your day. Don't start your service for God without praying first because you're going to have chaos on your hands. We shall never take people beyond our own spiritual attainment. If your wife and children, sir, don't see you pray, they're not going to pray. They're not going to pray as they should. Very few virtuous women, if, if, there are any, if there are any left. I don't believe there are many at all. And probably none. But very few women will pray by themselves. Some will pray in rebellion against their husband, but they don't want to pray with their husband because they think he's a numbskull and unspiritual. But husbands, fathers, if you don't pray with your family, if they don't see you pray and hear you pray all of the days of your life, they're not going to pray as they should, and they're not going to take God seriously. This is why I've been saying for over 30 years, it is a crime for a husband and a father to leave the house in the morning and not pray with his wife and children. As far as I'm concerned, it is a crime. That ought not to be done. That ought not to be the case. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we pray now, Lord, for the Christian families. Help us in our families to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek your face, and to turn from our wicked ways, and to humble ourselves, to seek your face, to pray, to repent, and to get back to you, our first love. 
Holy Father God, grant us your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit to pray together, but also to obey together so that we can stay together. For oh Lord, so many people have foolishly quit on their marriages for whatever reason and not stick around to see what the end is going to be. And what a tragedy. What a tragedy. And Lord, you have so many wonderful plans for so many marriages, but because so many Christians are selfish and uh, want what they want, they jumped out of their marriages and hit the ground hard and remarried, and now they're living in adultery children scattered and unblessed. They're sad, they're miserable. They're still not happy even though they've been married two or three different times because they tried to get somebody, a human being, to make them happy and that is impossible. You're the only somebody who can make us truly happy and if that's the case we can stay in any marriage and be happy and be cheerful and be joyful. And uh, one of the reasons why you have shut down the church is because of so many so-called Christians living in adultery, living in fornication, uh, children scattered all across the country, disheartened, disgusted, defeated, hurt, with selfish parents, as old as they can be, and as medicated as they can be, trying to still get their groove on, like they're teenagers. And so, Holy Father God, we pray for the healing of every Christian marriage and family and help every Christian marriage and family to stop being hypocritical in an Adams family at the house and the Brady Bunch at church. And now they got to, they're stuck in the house together. And they have a choice to be the Adams family with constant hell raising or to be a true godly Christian family and not hypocrites. And Lord, we pray for the salvation of the families that are lost all around the world, primarily because of us in your church who have not witnessed to them because we've been so busy trying to get our piece of the pie, trying to get money and prosperity and bigger houses and bigger cars. And we have forsaken your great commission and your great commandment. For Jesus Christ's sake, please have mercy and grace upon us all. Please forgive us of our sins, failures, and faults. And at the same time, Lord, some of us are going to still obey you and pray that you would add laborers to the whited harvest field. And Lord, even if you don't want to use us, uh, we pray that for the sake of the lost families, you would use somebody. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray and for his sake. Amen. Join me, ladies and gentlemen, in praying the Lord's prayer. Uh, we use the King James Version around here. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I believe that we only have one verse to read today. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. And I touched on the when we read Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 regarding the children on yesterday, I talked to the children, but I also talked to the parents quite a bit. But this verse is for the parents, and especially fathers, uh, because contrary to the American way, it is not left up to the mother to raise the children by herself. The ultimate authority and the ultimate responsibility is for the Father. Uh, God is going to hold the Father primarily responsible how the children turn out. The wife is, and the mother is supposed to join him and to help him raise the children in the way that he is led of the Lord to do so from the Word of God. In other words, uh, the wife does not need to be uh, standing by saying, I think you're too hard on Bobby. Please cut him some slack. That's not your role. Uh, your husband knows all about Bobby and how evil Bobby is. Your husband has been told by God to whip his butt. He's not going to die. You just go in the other room since you can't take it. <laughs> but the word of God says to all fathers, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I... Let me just give you a personal example of what I'm talking about. I, all families have children uh, who you have to deal with more than others. And normally it's going to be a boy, but you got some girls as well. But I had to deal with my oldest son. I had to whip him many times, B times. But I'm here before you today to tell you that it all was for the good because he turned out just fine. He's not perfect by no means. But whenever you have a son in his 20s, whenever you have a daughter, my daughter Danny, who is a model child growing up, and I had to, I didn't have to whip her as much, and I didn't have to rebuke her as much. And my uh, second oldest daughter, Danita, uh, one, of my, one of my most spiritual children, these three are already grown and gone, have graduated from college, and and they're doing their thing out in the world. But all three of them, but especially I want to talk about my oldest son. I had to whip him B times. He had a whole lot of foolishness bound in his heart. But in his 20s, and all of them are still in their 20s, And this is rare. My son, my oldest son, to help his father in the ministry and to make sure his father and family is taken care of, sends me $600 every month. He's not the most... Uh, lovey-dovey kind of a guy, but throughout his time under my authority, 
he was he was the quickest to say, I love you, Papa. And I already told you about the wonderful Father's Day gift he sent me, in addition to the money, but more importantly, the wonderful card he wrote. And so, and you got to understand, he was... <laughs> He was my worst child, the hardest child to deal with. I hate to say it, he, 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 and he knows that I told him. He, he uh, had many of his mother's rebellious ways, prideful, stubborn, rebellious ways. And I had to deal with him. I had to whip him and to punish him and chastise him and make him uh, get work done that he didn't want to get done and so forth. And now he is excelling in, in, in what he's doing right now above and beyond. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and I talked with him the other night just even more respectful, more respectful than ever before. And uh, he told me that he's praying more and reading the Bible more. He says God has, has spoken to his heart on his own. Now, the money is not the big issue. You must understand when a child, a, 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 a young person in their 20s, sends you back willingly on their own. Because, and don't, they don't have to do it. But God touches their heart to send their father who chastised them and rebuked them and dealt with them sometimes harshly to get his attention. It all pays off in the end. And I feel sorry for you parents who try to be buddy-buddy with your children while they're growing up thinking that it is a playground in the family when in fact it is a training ground. And it can get hard sometimes and rough sometimes. But you don't need to go to your little cave and, and not deal with the situation at hand. And then you don't know where your child is and your child is not productive and your child is a pain in the neck when they when they get grown and you don't know them and they don't know you and I cannot emphasize to you enough the great feeling as a parent of leaving it all on the field giving them everything you've got all of the love you have all of the love on both sides patting them on the back when they do good nurturing them. When they do well, they're, they're, sometimes when I, I was able to pat him on the back and say, man, you did a great job on that. One of the things he, he did, and he didn't know I was doing it to help him more than helping me, but one of the things he did, he did well. And he hardly ever failed in this area. He failed a few times. And that was the preparing, helping me to prepare the sermons because he had a father who was preaching the gospel every day, and he had to help prepare the sermons. Many of them he wrote on his own by himself. And he, and he was late on many things, but he was hardly ever late in getting having those sermons ready, which was the most important thing. But he learned a lot from that. Plus, he had to deal with the Word of God. And now the Word of God, we're thousands of miles away now from each other, now the Word of God is in his heart working on him, nurturing him and on, on the sermons. And there were some sermons he, he wrote, I know God helped him. <laughs> and, so, and, 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 and there were times when I needed a special sermon. God spoke to my heart about something, and I needed it right then and there within a half an hour. And some of the best sermons he ever wrote, he wrote within 15, 20 minutes. And I, all I had to do was just give him just the gist of it, and he had it down, bam. And if I wanted him to do it today, he, he would do it and send it back to me today. 
but out of respect for him and in, in, in his new life, I am not doing that, and my baby son is, is doing it, and he's doing a good job as well. So pat them on the back when they do well, but pat them on the butt when they do evil, because foolishness, the Bible says, is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. And it may not seem like it is happening that day, but eventually, by and by, after a while, you are consistent and you don't stop and you deal with them until they leave. When they get out there under God by themselves and God start whipping up on them and dealing with them, all that's going to come, uh, come to pass and come in handy, what you did with them when you had them. You don't... As my psychological, uh, my psychology teacher rather taught at Texas Wesleyan University in an undergraduate class, in an undergraduate class, your job, parents, is to make your children lovable. And some of us, some of us as parents have not done that. Your child is a devil and they're not lovable and they're not loving. And you know that they shouldn't marry anybody. We're dealing with a pastor right now who has an evil son attracted to children. And he never, a well-respected pastor, well-known, and he never did anything about it, never said anything about it. Shame before God. So nurture your children when they do well. Pat them on the back. Encourage them to keep on. And the idea is, is for them to keep on doing well. But if, they're, if, they're, if they do evil and they're filled with the devil, you better with their butts to try to save their soul from hell. And that's why we have such a problem in our country today, because parents have forsaken the word of God, even in the church. And you're constantly going back and forth with your child. We have a out of control daughter, daughter of the, not not us, but the daughter of the. Uh, uh, the uh, advisor to the president. You probably have heard about her. She's out of control. Uh, I would have taken her to the woodshed a long time ago before she ever done anything as wicked and as evil as she's doing. But it's not just her fault. Her parents are out of control. I forget the lady's name. But be that as it may, Fathers, understand God's going to hold you accountable ultimately for how your children turn out, and the wife too, the mother too, but uh, she's in a helping role. And may God help you and the children if she's running everything. And got secrets with the children that you don't know anything about, you don't find out until five years later other such foolishness. And be that as it may, my beloved, let's pray. Let's pray for fellow Christians. Let's pray for those in government. Let's pray for those who are grieving and those who need to be saved and those who need to be healed and uh, so on and so forth. We have a whole lot to pray about. Holy Father God, I praise you and I thank you for your holy word that instructs us on what we ought to do and how we ought to do it in the family and otherwise. And Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ 
Abash in your uh, Christian family. Uh, Lord, to get right with you, help us to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek your face, and to turn from our wicked ways, and to repent, and to get right with you, and to get back to you, our first love. Holy Father, God, continue to have mercy and grace upon such wretched and wicked people as we are because of your Holy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Please forgive us of our sins, our failures, and our faults. As we from our hearts, by your grace, forgive those who have sinned against us. And Holy Father, God, crush and crucify our flesh and the old man within us all and fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit to love right, live right, think right, and do right. And now, Lord, we pray for everybody in the government. We pray, Lord, for the President of the United States on down, his family and his administration. And Lord, help them to humble themselves help them to pray and help them to seek your face as they claim to be Christians and help them to turn from their wicked ways, their pride and their foolishness and how they are doing great damage to the lives of millions of people by going in this proud and arrogant and stubborn way. Open their blinded eyes and unstop their deaf ears save their souls, help them to forget about Republican and Democrat, and serve the people. And Lord God in heaven, we pray for uh, everybody in the administration, everybody who is a governor, all governors, all statewide government, all senators, all representatives, uh, in Washington and in every state, every mayor, every city council, every school board, uh, every uh, police chief and the peace officers, all of the peace officers, every sheriff and all uh, deputy sheriffs all people who are in authority everywhere. We pray for salvation, spiritual, family, life, financial, material, protection, and provision blessings upon them all. And we pray that you protect all of those who are out there protecting us, for they have a calling on them and a ministry as well. And Holy Father God, we pray for all of the people who are grieving and who are hurting and uh, because they have lost uh, loved ones to the coronavirus plague. And we pray that you would draw them to yourself, uh, Lord, for salvation and comfort. Draw them to your, your Holy Scriptures for salvation and comfort as well. And we pray for some by name. We pray for all of the families who are hurting. We pray for the family of Massachusetts priest Richard Napoleon Ottaway. We pray for the family and friends of New York priest Richard Cogan. We pray for the family and friends of California church member Joe Alexander. We pray for the family and friends of California church member Maria Teresa Banson. We pray for the family and friends of California pastor Alex Bernard. We pray for the family and friends of California church choir member Robert Brewster. We pray for the family and friends of California church musician Resi Cameron. We pray for the family 
and the friends of California Church member Rosalie George. We pray for the family and friends of California Church member Mike Gothelock. We pray for the family and friends of California Church member Tessie Henry. And we pray for the millions of family members and friends of those who have passed away because of the coronavirus plague. And Holy Father God, we pray for the salvation of those who are lost in this country and around the globe and in the media. We pray for the revival of those who are saved in this country, around the globe, and the media. We pray for those who are sick, if they're willing to confess their sins to you, to the elders of the church, and to others. Heal them who are saved, save those who are lost. And Holy Father God, we pray for all other countries in the world uh, the same way we pray for our country. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the protection of Israel. We pray for all saints who are being persecuted in China, in Nigeria, and around the world. Comfort them as only you can and uh, give them your grace and your strength to deal with what they're dealing with and deliver them from dangerous situations according to your will. And Holy Father God, we pray now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for all of the people who have sent in prayer requests. Hear and answer their prayers and hear and answer our prayers for them. And Lord, we pray for salvation, spiritual, family, life, financial, material, protection, and provision blessings upon them all. Uh, Lord, and you know the names of the thousands upon thousands of people who have sent in prayer requests. And Lord, we pray for a few by name that have come in recently. Uh, Lord, hear and answer our prayer for them. We pray now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for Candace, provide her with a job and help her to get her life back on track bring unity back to her family, bless her children with good health, and give them safety. We pray for A.D., provide him with divine intervention, and help him to get married. Give him a house of his own and ministerial breakthrough. We pray for Doreen, be with her and her family, save those who are lost in her family, revive those who are saved. We pray for Lenitra, help her as a single mother to raise her three children, provide financially for their bills and other household needs as well. We pray for Edmund, bring religious freedom to Poland, help Edmund, his wife, Dorothy, their daughter, Anne, and their sons, Peter and Daniel, to serve you. Give wisdom for learning in school, to Daniel, provide work for Edmund and Dorothy. Help Peter to find and follow your direction for his life. Bless Anne with a husband. And Lord, thank you for the privilege of praying for that family over in Poland for many years as they've sent requests over and over again. We pray for Freddie, help him to deal with his totally rebellious children we pray for Jimmy, strengthen him and his family, help them to do that which is right in your sight. And now, Lord, we pray for the people who have trusted you as Savior. Help these to grow in the faith and to be the strong Christians you want them to be. We pray for all of the other thousands who have gotten saved through the preaching of the gospel down through the years as well. Help them to grow in the faith and be the Christians you want them to be. As we pray for these by name, we pray for Rusha, we pray for Elvis, we pray for Tammy, we pray for G, we pray for Borchett, we pray for Kobe, and we pray for Jeanette. And Holy Father God, we pray for uh, the people who have recommitted their lives to you after hearing the preaching of your Holy Word uh, through this ministry. Uh, help these to stand help these to stand strong in the faith and we pray for the thousands of others who have done so as we are only praying for a few by name we pray for Marina, we pray for Billy, we pray for Maggie we pray for Hippolytus, we pray for Sharon 
We pray for Yaakov, and we pray for Samantha. We commit all of these souls into your hands. Let your will be done in their lives and in ours. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Beloved, our final devotional reading today is titled, It All Starts With God, Part 2, from the Purpose Driven Life by Dr. Rick Warren. <clears throat> now, I hope that Dr. Rick Warren and his publisher may have made this uh, extraordinary book uh, into a devotional. We, we made it into a devotional. Uh, I read it. I didn't read it for myself. Uh, I, in fact, I was taken aback by so many older Christians uh, who thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. Because all older Christians, in my opinion, should have known uh, the wonderful things he wrote in that book. But nobody wrote it better than he did. But it is a book, in my opinion, that all young Christians should read, maybe two or three times before they even go to college, yeah, on, a, on a high school level. And so that's what I did. And that's why we included it in, uh, and it's such a great book and a well-written book, even though there are people who hate it and hate Rick Warren for some reason, I don't know. <coughs> It is such a good book. We put it ourselves. We didn't wait for them to write a devotional. We put it among all of our devotional books. And I read it to my children myself because I wanted to make sure they read it. And so we use it with other devotional books. Dr. Rick Warren said, I once got lost in the mountain when I stopped to ask for directions to the campsite I was told you can't get there from here you must start from the other side of the mountain in the same way you cannot arrive at your life's purpose by starting with a focus on yourself. You must begin with your focus on God, your Creator. You exist only because God wills that you exist. And by the way, if I may add, if you don't get a hold of that statement, you're going to be a miserable puppy for the rest of your life. It's all about God, my dear friends. It's not about you. You're not God. You're not close to being God. You are a creature created by God. And the only reason why you're living today is because of God. So you need to humble yourself down and let God be God. And you be you. And you will never get happy. You'll never get to the point of being happy until you understand that, that little sentence, that little truth right there. That the only reason why you are living today is because God wills that you live. That, that is worth the price of admission right there. We can shut it down right on that point. I don't even feel like going any further. Because we have a whole bunch of... See, the reason, one of the reasons why we're in this plague is because people don't understand this. Even in the church... You were made by God. You were made by God and for God. And until you understand that, life will never make sense to you. And that is a fact. And you will be a miserable, sad, depressed little puppy for the rest of your life, my beloved. <laughs> yes, you will. You'll be confused and sad and down and downcast all the time. Always want to throw a pity party because you do not respect God and the fact that he made you and you need to do what he told you to do and what he wants you to do. You didn't make yourself. 
It is only in God that we discover our origin, our identity, our meaning, our purpose, our significance, and our destiny. Every other path leads to a dead end. Many people try to use God for their own self-actualization, but that is a reversal of nature and is doomed to failure. You were made for God, not vice versa, and life is about letting God use you for his purposes, not your using him for your own purpose. Go ahead, Rick. Tell the people the truth. The Bible says obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. See, this will set you free if you want to be free. But see, some of you are too stinking proud to receive this. You're proud as the devil. You're stubborn as the devil. You're hard-headed, stiff-necked, rebellious, set in your damnable ways. You're practicing witchcraft because you don't. You won't let this in. You won't let this into your head because you're too proud. You won't humble yourself down and pray and seek God's face and turn from your wicked ways. You need this right here. That's the reason why you're not happy. You're not cheerful. You're not joyful. Out of all of the questions that Niles asked Frazier on the show Frazier, the one that took Frazier for a loop, was a simple question over coffee. Frazier, are you happy? And he couldn't answer that question. He struggled to answer that question. With all the money and all the fame that Frazier had, he was still not happy. And that's how so many of you are. You got this, you got that, you can go get more, and you're still not happy. <clears throat> because you got life, excuse me, I'm going to use a phrase from my father, Bishop Daniel White Jr., you got life ass backwards. You're putting yourself first and what you want and not God first. And so you're at a dead end and you can't turn it, you can't, you can't get out of it until you repent. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious free life for the glory of God and for the lifting up of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Holy Father God, what a time it has been with you this morning in this standing between the living and the dead memorial, prayer, devotional, and yes, evangelistic service. Lord, out of all of the services, as you know, uh, the devil has fought this one more, probably because it does so much, and it is so important, and I give you the glory, praise, and honor for putting it in my heart to do it, and uh, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that everybody would take heed to your holy word that they heard today. Take heed to uh, your holy word regarding parenting. Take heed, Lord, especially to the final devotional. Uh, That will set them free to do all of the other things that they heard this morning in a very special and powerful way. And now, Holy Father God, we pray that you will save that soul that is nearest hell. Revive every Christian. Help us to humble ourselves. Help us to pray. Help us to seek your face. Help us to turn from our wicked ways. Help us to repent and to get back right with you and back to you, Lord Jesus, our first love. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Now, dear friend, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in the free pardon of your sins, 
you need to understand two things real quick before I can help you understand uh, what it means to be saved. First, you must understand that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's laws and God's commandments. The Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is a universal fact stated by God. He's the only one who knows that. Nobody else knows that we all have sinned. And because we didn't know it and we don't know it and can't know that, God gave us the revelation that we all have violated his law. We all have broken the Ten Commandments. We all have told lies in our life. Verbally or non-verbally, we've told lies. Some have told little white lies. Some have told little black lies. But they're all lies. And when you're a liar, your feet ain't made and your heart pumps peanut butter. We all have lied. We all have stolen things in our lives. Even if it was a few pennies from our father's penny jar to go buy some candy down at Annie's candy store or at Combo's across the highway. Five cents to buy some now laters. You stole. You're a thief. Well, we stole a pen on the job. Because that way we didn't have to buy a pen. We stole some paper from the job. That way we didn't have to buy any paper for the house. I know of a preacher friend of mine. I never participated in his evil, but he was still paper towels. Had no compunction about it whatsoever from the job. He never bought paper towels from the store. He stole them from the job, and I would rebuke him for it. He didn't pay me any attention. Had no guilt about it at all. I felt guilty for him. We've stolen things before. We've lied before. We all have lusted and coveted in our hearts after people and things. We all have dishonored and disobeyed and disrespected our parents at times. We all have taken God's name in vain at times. We all have sinned against God. And if you didn't do any of those things, you did something else wrong. You are a sinner. We're all sinners. God revealed that to us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of sin always and everywhere in the universe, sin must be punished. There's a penalty for sin. There's a punishment for sin. God said the wages of sin is death. We all must die. That's the reason why we die. Why else would these priceless, you can't even put a price on the brain, much less the rest of the body. You, you can't even put a price on the eyeball, much less the rest of the body. Who, who, who made that, all that? God. He never intended for us to die. I'm talking about a space suit. You in you in your space suit? God made this body to live on Earth. But we sinned against God. And once we sinned against God, Adam and Eve, our forefathers, sin passed on to us, and the wages of sin is death. <clears throat> the payment for sin is death. The body will die, and you will your body will be buried. The soul, the real you, your soul is living inside your body. Your soul will, can't die. 
is going to live somewhere forever, either in hell, if you reject Jesus Christ, or in heaven, if you receive Christ. And that leads me to my next point. Jesus Christ. Hell is bad news. You don't want to go to hell because hell is forever. And hell is a place of torment. Jesus Christ described hell as a place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus Christ described hell, yes, the meek and lowly and lovely one and the loving one described hell as a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. By the way, Jesus Christ preached more on hell than all of the other preachers and prophets in the Bible. He preached more on hell than he did about heaven. Why? Because he came to die on the cross for your sins to save your soul from hell. He does not want you to go to hell, so he warns you about that awful place. It is there, and you will go there if you reject Christ and you don't believe in Christ. So hell is bad news, but I have some good news for you. In John chapter 3.16, Jesus said these amazing words, For God so loved the world. That means that God loves you. If you are in this world, God loves you. He gave his only begotten Son. Jesus Christ was speaking of himself. Jesus Christ, you must understand, never sinned in word, in thought, or indeed, Jesus Christ never lusted after a woman. Jesus Christ never told a lie. Jesus Christ never stole anything from anybody. Jesus Christ never took God's name in vain. Jesus Christ did not disrespect and disobey his parents. <clears throat> the Bible says, He being God, subjected himself to his stepfather and mother because Joseph was not his father God was and God is he became a human through Mary not Joseph but but he knew more than the theologians of his time and but then he subjected himself the Bible says to his parents he never disrespected his parents never committed a sin in word thought or deed and then when he started his ministry, one of his first miracles was he made water into wine instantaneously. He walked on the water like we walk on the floor because he made the water. Jesus Christ raised the dead. Jesus Christ healed the sick. Jesus Christ gave sight to the blind, fed the hungry miraculously. And then at the end of his life, towards the end of his life, he chose to be the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. And he chose to suffer, bleed and die on the cross for your sins and mine was buried and rose on the third day. Do you know him? If you don't know him, get to know him today by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, that word whosoever means anybody at any time, believeth in him, believeth means have faith in, trust in, him, Jesus Christ, should not perish. That means perish in hell. In the last phrase, but have everlasting life. That means go to heaven and be with God in Jesus. The saints and the angels forever. So, dear friend, depend upon God's word. <clears throat> Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Obey 
what Jesus has told you to do. And he simply told you to believe in him. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose on the third day. Pray and ask him to save your soul, for the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you don't feel that comfortable about praying this prayer called the sinner's prayer, I'll be glad to help you. Please follow me in the sinner's prayer as you believe in your heart in none other and nothing else but Jesus Christ. You don't have to be in a church. You don't have to become a church member to be saved. You don't have to get baptized to be saved or to get saved or do anything else to get saved but believe in Jesus Christ. Call on his name and ask him to save you, and he will. Repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I have done evil in your sight. For Jesus Christ's sake, please have mercy and grace upon my sin, upon me, and forgive me of all of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart in Jesus Christ, I believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose on the third day. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul and change my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of my sins past. Help me to turn from my evil life and to follow you in the new life, Lord Jesus. For it is in your name I do pray. Amen. Now, dear friend of mine, if you just believed in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, and you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it from your heart, I declare to you that based upon the Word of God, you are now saved from hell and you are on your way to heaven. Dear friend, welcome to the family of God. I want to congratulate you on doing the most important thing in life, and that is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, go to gospellightsociety.com and read my pamphlet titled, or read my book titled, and download my book free of charge. We're going to fix it where you can download the pamphlet as well, titled, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10:9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Until next time, my beloved, may the Lord bless you and keep you, is my prayer. And the next time for me, before the cameras, will be hopefully in about 15 to 20 minutes, as I will come back and hopefully do a brief how to stay the coronavirus plague and how to survive it uh, briefing podcast I believe it's up 19 or 9 if be with us giving you some fresh home to accept it The sound of will your children and for a hope and as one of the school Dr. Ray you need to you don't 
home. Keep your proper screws. Then you who uh, uh, to the, you don't have passes, passes why Apologizing to the moving, moving services pre that's what doing right now. That's the I'm Stanley. I have Old Testament. Uh, I prophet. It's not test because sexuality. That's what I, I believe. Even he, he, even he, has for the rest of the first to do. He has. You thing that is because he can't, can't promise to um, keep the people out. I the thought is at the most God. Friend. Holy Father is for today, this morning, in light of all you deal with, and arrive back. Thank you for allowing to accomplish the good to get done. And we thank you for being here in time this morning. Some of us, and, and uh, so much for inside of uh, Judas's and, and battles, and be used by the devil to try your word. And I pray 